about the same thickness, it's flat, it's crumpled up uh, to give it more surface area, and it, it uh, covers our brain. And it's what's capable of really what we call human thought, of being able to recognize patterns, to see those patterns in a hierarchy, so we can recognize certain frequency structures and golden phonemes, and we can recognize sequences of phonemes and certain words, and we can recognize sequences of words and certain phrases, and then we can draw a meaning from those words and phrases, and we can create an idea to hopefully together a whole pattern of other ideas, and then we can give a name to that idea and use it in another idea. So we build up in this recursive fashion a whole hierarchy of ideas, and we call that human knowledge. And only human beings have an exponentially expanding knowledge base because of this very powerful neocortex that we have, which is where our thinking takes place. And we're not learning actually how the neocortex works. It's something that I've been studying, I've been writing in a book called How, how the Mind Works and How the Old One. And it turns out that the neocortex has one little structure recognize the pattern, and it's repeated over and over again, uh, tens of billions of times. And each of these little structures is basically the same. And they're actually wired in hierarchy, so we can see an idea with a lot of higher or quarter ideas. And it's the neocortex which analyzes, say, visual information, or auditory information, or tactile information, or ideas, or human language, or confronts a problem, or even that controls our, our ability to walk and talk and, and do our physical skills. It's all the same little module that can recognize a pattern and learn it and apply it, repeat it over and over again. So this is actually quite different than what scientists have thought up until recently before we could actually look inside the brain. Brain scientists talk about, have talked about the visual cortex, where visual information is processed in the brain. Well, it turns out that you know, since the optic nerve is near a certain part of the neocortex, in a sighted person there will be an area of the neocortex that happens to process visual information. But there's actually nothing special about it. It's really not a visual cortex. It's just a kind of recognizer. And in fact, if someone does not have visual information, if they happen to be blind, that portion of the neocortex will be processing other information. That it is uh, used just like anyone else's neocortex. So if you learn Braille, it will be applied to Braille. Some people talk about how blind people have better perception of sound information, but actually, we have better perception of whatever kinds of information we study. If you ever wonder you know, why you are who you are, it's because we create ourselves. We create our own brain. What we happen to learn, if we happen to spend years studying Braille, then we will devote a lot of our neocortex uh, to that. And uh, you know, musicians spend a lot of time with auditory information, and they'll have a lot of their neocortex devoted to sound information. Uh, so it's a very flexible, very powerful ability to take any information that comes into the brain and understand it and make sense of it. And it led to another major innovation, which was technology. Uh, we actually need one other revolutionary capability, which is our thumb. And if you think that that's not a very useful part of your anatomy, it actually was another prerequisite to our creating our tools. Because we could then take these ideas in our neocortex of how things could be, and how we could overcome our limitations, and then actually build those things uh, with this opposable appendage. And so with our tools, uh, we're able to overcome our limitations. I can't fly, but I was able to use a tool to get here from Boston. And uh, we're able to transcend our boundaries with our tools. We didn't stay in the ground, we didn't stay in the planet, we didn't stay with the limitations of our biology. You know, life expectancy is 23, a uh, thousand years ago, so most of us wouldn't be here, and the rest of us would be senior citizens if it wasn't for our tools. And that brings me to technology for the blind. This is another example of transcending our boundaries uh, through the tools that we create. But in order to really do that, you, you need to have guidance. 
needs intimate guidance from the people who really understand uh, what's needed. And the collaboration that I've had with the National Federation of the Blind has really made the progress we've seen reading machines possible. From the very first reading machine that uh, Dr. Bauer and his colleagues and I worked on in the 70s uh, to the reading machines we have today. And we also need access to the technology, we need training so people know how to use the technology, we need to integrate it into our overall solutions and educational programs, and the National Federation of Blind has been a leader in all of those endeavors. And we can see benefits of what I call the law of accelerating returns, which is just this biological evolution built innovation on innovation, uh, so has te technological evolution. We use our tools to create new tools. So the tools grow exponentially in power. And it's remarkable how predictable that is. The, the power of computers doubles for the same cost in less than a year. Uh, so when I was a student at MIT, I went to MIT, was, MIT was so advanced in 1965 that it actually had a computer. And I took up a room about this size and it was shared by thousands of us. The computer and your cell phone today same cell phone you can use for the ANFB Reader Mobile uh, is a million times cheaper and a thousand times more powerful. That's a billion fold increase in price performance. The amount of computers that you can get is per dollar. And that, that applause really recognizes the technology which human society creates. And it's, it's remarkable how predictable this is and, and how powerful it is. And what today fits in a, what used to fit in a building now fits in a cell phone in the pocket, but now fits in your pocket will fit literally in a blood cell uh, in 25 years. And if it weren't for this collaboration between the organized blind, who have a deep understanding of the needs of blind people, uh, and the technology developers, and the profound overlap between those groups, because many of the technology developers are led to or members of the National Federation of Blind. We may not have fabric machines at all, or if we did, uh, they really wouldn't meet the needs of the blind users. So, reading machines out of themselves is a good example. The first reading machine that we came out with on January 13, 1976. And I remember that date because Walter Cronkite used it for a signature of sign off. <laughs> So, in collaboration, 